some things. And that's why we have to go through some of our trials. That's why God takes us through some, tem some temptations. That's why He takes us through some tests so that we can learn something. We can get some experience by the things that we go through. And as we go through these things, I believe that God is trying to raise us up. What He did for David on the back side of the mountain when nobody was giving Him accolade, when nobody knew His name. Nobody knew his name. Nobody knew who David was on the back side of the mountain taking care of the sheep. But he knew that one day, one day, one day I'm coming out of this. Hallelujah. That's what you need to tell yourself right now. One day I'm coming out of this. One day I'm going to come out of this thing. One day God is going to rise up in me. One day God is going to do something great. God is going to turn some things around. Today. I thank you today. I thank you today. Peter and John, Peter and John going into the temple, going into the temple at the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon by our time. They're going into the temple to give God some praise. And as they're on their way into the temple, as they make their way in, I'm sure that this man has been out there every day. I don't know why this was that first encounter with him. I don't know if this was their first encounter, but this is the first encounter that was recorded in the book of Acts by Luke. He said that as they were on their way in, just as this man had done for everybody else that's going in, can you give me a dollar? Brother, can you spare a five? Can you give me a little something? I need some food for my family. I need some food. I need some medication. I need some money to take care of my needs. But Peter, hallelujah. He looked into this man's eyes and he said, silver and gold have I none. Hallelujah. But what I do have. And we shouldn't be ashamed of what we have. We shouldn't be ashamed of what we have. You know, sometimes when you're on the corner and a person's asking you for some money, and you say, okay, well, all I have is a little change. All I have is some coins. All I have is 50 cents. But we shouldn't be ashamed. What we should do, we should give them that 50 cents. We should give them that quarter. And we say, this is all I have financially. But I'm telling you, what you need is more, hallelujah, than 25 cents. What you need is more than a dollar. I know a God that's able to supply every need you have. I know a God that's able to bring you over this corner. I see your sign saying that you're homeless. I see your sign saying that, the, hallelujah, my children need some food. We don't have a place to stay. I'm telling you, I know a God that's able to meet every need. He's able, he's able, he's able. He's able to do it. God has what you need today. God has what you need. But we have to put our trust in him. We have to put our trust in him. Hallelujah. So Peter, and we know the lifestyle of Peter before he met, uh, before he really uh, was converted, right? We know his lifestyle. Uh, we know how Peter was quick to talk. Peter was quick with action, quick to grab the sword and cut off the ear uh, of the soldier that were coming after Jesus. We know Peter, the one that said, oh, so, so Lord, if this you, then bid me to come while Jesus was walking on the water. Hallelujah. He said, bid for me to come to you. And Jesus said, come on, come this way. Come meet me right here on the water. And Peter got out of the boat. Now, he had confidence in God. He had confidence that the Lord, if the Lord is on the water, and if he told me to come sometime, we say we need one word from the Lord. We say we need one word. If we could get one word from the Lord, then our situation would change. If we could get one word from God, then, then all of my problems would be answered. But he gave Peter one word. He said, come. He said, come. And Peter got out and he began to walk towards Jesus on the water. And as long as he kept his eyes on the Lord. And I believe that's a message to all of us today. If we would keep our eyes on the Lord, I believe that God is able to hold us up. 
God is able to sustain us. God is able to make sure that we don't seek, that we don't fall, that the attacks of the enemy don't come and overwhelm us. I know the enemy comes in sometimes as a flood. He comes in from the left and the right and from every direction. The enemy is coming in with all kind of trouble. He's coming in, he's coming in, but God is saying that when the enemy comes in as a flood, that I'm going to be there to lift up a standard to make sure that you don't go down. You're not going to go under. As long as you're standing on my word, as long as you're fulfilling my word, then I'm going to be there for you. I believe the word of God today, saints of God, that the Lord said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what your problem may be. I don't care what your circumstances are. He he said, I'll never leave you, and I won't forsake you. He is a very present help. In our time of trouble, in our time of despair, we can call on Jesus, and he's right there. Praise God. So Peter was one way before Pentecost, but after the day of Pentecost came, and he was in that room with all of those other disciples. He was in that room, that upper room, with the 120. And, uh, and the Holy Spirit came down and it filled the place. It came down and it, it, it just came down and indwelled in them, the Holy Spirit. Once he got the Spirit of God in him, then the talk that he, that he, that he used to do was a different talk. He began to preach the word of God and as he began to preach the word of God in his first revival, 3,000 souls were saved. And he began to work for God wholeheartedly. He began to have a different understanding and a different revelation of who Jesus really was. You know, sometimes you can live with people and, and you think that you know who people are. Sometimes people are around you and they grow up with you and, and all you see is little baby Jesus. And that's how they saw Jesus uh, in, his, in his community, right? Uh, in Nazareth, where he grew up. Because this, the Bible tells us that he could not do many great works there in Nazareth because of how they saw him. They saw him with their natural eyes. They saw him as Joseph and Mary's son. They saw him as just a carpenter. They didn't see him as a Messiah. They knew that he had not gone to any theological institution. He had not gone to seminary. He didn't have the training as the Pharisees or the Sadducees. They saw him as Jesus. And sometimes people will look at you like that. They'll see you in the past that you were. They'll see your past life. And that's where they want to keep you. They want to keep you right there in the past. They knew what you used to do and how you used to talk and how you used to act. And they'll come up to you. But I tell you, if you live this life, and I believe Apostle Paul had to go through the same challenge because of his background. He had to go through that same challenge because of how he had persecuted the Christians, how he had persecuted them. They didn't believe that his conversion was real. But all you have to do is live the life. You live the life. You live the life and your life will speak for you. God will show himself righteous in your life. He'll show himself strong and people can have their doubts as long as they want to. I was watching a movie with my wife recently, saw this movie, and there was this young lady that she had some knowledge, and she knew that she had something that was special about her, that was something special about her, but she didn't know what it was. But as she began to uh, grow up, and as she began to uh, meet other people that were gifted, uh, one person in particular told her that she was more special than he was. She saw his gift. You know, sometimes people can see uh, other people, and you know, I think one thing that a uh, pastor friend of mine said during the shut-in, that a lot of people suffer from comparisonitis. You know, they, they compare themselves with other people. They compare themselves with, with other people, how gifted other people are, how God uses other people. And they try to be like somebody else, but God, God wants us to be ourselves. God wants us to use our ministry in the way that, that we've been called to minister. God wants to use us in our way. Don't try to be somebody else. But this, this, this young lady, she found out that, that, that she, was, she was gifted. She was gifted. She had some gifts on the inside of her that, that had never been tapped into. And I believe that God has some gifts inside of some of us here today. 
that have not really been tapped into. We have not really reached the full resources of who we really are. But God wants those, He wants those to come out. He wants those to come to fruition. And I tell you, it would be a blessing to the church. It would be edifying to the church if everyone that had those gifts inside of them would allow God to let those gifts come to the forefront. Let those gifts be manifested. You know, and this person, she, 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 in that movie, she saw that, she realized that yes, there are some things that I know, some things that I know that, I know, I know that God is calling me, I know that God wants to use me, but I'm not willing to do it. I'm not willing to step out. I'm not willing to get out. You know, the, the motto we have here is it, it takes courage to walk by faith. It takes courage to step out and to trust God. It takes courage to believe God and His Word because scientifically, you know, we want to see it. We want to see it first before we believe it. You know, we talk a lot about Thomas and we, we down him for, for his not believing, but we want to see some things before we'll say, okay, yeah, now I believe it's true. But I tell you, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And if we're going to believe God, if we're going to be a, a, in a relationship with God, then God tells us in Hebrews 11 and 6 that without faith it's impossible to please me. We must have faith. We must have faith in God. We have to believe that He is. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after Him. Not just seeking after Him with a cursory relationship, but if we diligently seek after Him. How do we diligently seek after God? That's a good question. How do we diligently seek after Him? I believe that it's important for us to, to congregate together. It's important for us to come to the house of the Lord. I believe that iron sharpens iron. I believe that we have to come to the house of God to hear the word of God. Faith comes by what? And hear it by what? Hear it by the word of God. So if you don't hear the word of God, if you don't come and if you don't hear the word of God, and, and if the word doesn't come through your preacher, the word has to come through your preacher. And I believe that God still uses men today. He said, you're going to be my conduit. I'm going to download my word through you. And I want you to dispatch that word to the people of God day by day. But I tell you, there's too many people bootlegging the gospel, hallelujah, that bootlegging it for Cadillacs, that bootlegging it for Mercedes, that bootlegging it for relationships, there's too many people, hallelujah, that are walking falsely in the gospel, but God is looking for a real worshiper, God is looking for a real man, and what of God, it's time out for playing church, it's time out for playing church, we need to get right with God, I believe that it's time for us to get right, get right to Hallelujah. Get right, church, so we can be prepared to go home. I believe that God is coming back one day. I believe that Jesus is soon to come as you look out over this world and you see the hurricanes, you see the tornadoes, you see the typhoons, you see the tsunamis, you see all of the things that are going on in this world today. I believe that God is giving us a sign that he's soon to come back. All of these things will be happening in diverse places. And the, the, the return of God is imminent. We need to get right, church. We need to get right. We need to get right. We need to settle our differences. Settle our differences. Our little petty things that we're going through with one another. We need to learn how to have a thick skin. Hallelujah. As children of God. We need to learn how to love one another. We need to learn how to love one another. The Bible tells us that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. A lot of people love themselves, but they don't love their neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? That was a question, oh my God, the question that was asked by the disciple, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? I believe the Samaritan showed us what being a good neighbor was all about. Not anybody that you know, not anybody that you know that you have to help. You don't have to just know them to help them, but I believe that help should be in you if you are a child of God. Right. Help should be in you as a child of God, because I believe that God looked beyond all of our faults one day. I'll tell you, my faults were many. I had many faults. I had many things that I was. I know I wasn't doing right. I had some hang-ups, and I had some habits, and 
I had some ways about me. But God looked beyond all of my faults and He saw the need that I had for salvation. And I'm so glad that He saved me one day. That He lifted me up out of the muck and the miry clay and set my feet on a firm foundation. He gave me another chance. I know I should have been dead. I should have been dead a long time ago before I met my wife. I should have been dead and sleeping in my grave. I was in the middle of many situations, in the middle of many circumstances where my life should have been taken, but God spared my life because God saw me behind this pulpit one day. God saw that I was going to be a preacher of the gospel. And just like Saul, just like Saul, yeah, you see me now. You see me now. You see what I'm doing right now. But don't count me out because I'm not in the kingdom. Don't count me out because I have some habits, because I have some hang-ups. Don't count me out. God is going to use me. I believe. Hallelujah. Bishop Blake said, I see you in the future. I see you in the future. I believe God. God is in the future. And he said, you look much better now. You look much better in the future. Praise God. Okay, let me give you a couple of things here, and then I'm going to be done. I'm going to be done. There was a religious leader. I heard a story years ago about a religious leader that went to visit the Pope. And he was showing the Pope, the Pope showed him, rather, all of the treasures of the church, how blessed the church was with money and um, space and you know the edifice nice this church was blessed and the Pope said to this religious leader no longer can the church say silver and gold have I none no longer can the church say that silver and gold have I none but the reply that the religious leader gave back to the Pope was yes father but have you ever thought that the church is in danger of also not being able to say, in the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Yes, we're blessed sometimes with fine edifices. We're blessed with a whole lot of money. I see a lot of preachers with airplanes able to jet off to different places for ministry, but are we still, uh, are we still able to say that in the name of Jesus, I believe the old church didn't have the things that we have, but they did have the power of God in the place. I heard Minister Allen talk sometimes about, hallelujah, walking into the churches and seeing the crutches on the wall, seeing the wheelchairs parked, and they came in one way, but they left another way, and I tell you, that's what this man experienced after his encounter with Peter and John, as they were going into the temple, hallelujah, this man was sitting there, had been lame all of his life, had been dependent on people all of his life, but Peter and John told them, we don't have the money, the money that you're looking for is only a temporary fix, but what we have is Greater. What we have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, and that's what we need to do when we pray for people. We may not be able to bless them with the finances, but we are able to pray for them. We're able to pray. We're able to pray. We're able to pray that God will turn things around for them. We're able to pray that God will meet their needs. We're able to pray that we don't have to do it ourselves, but God will open up a door supernaturally. I don't know if God has ever done a supernatural blessing in your life. If God is able to bless you, has ever, if he's able to bless you uh, in a supernatural way, if you allow him to bless you and to bless your life, God is still able to do that. He's still able. There's no lack in God. There's no shortage in God. God is still able to do what he did years ago. I'm just going to give you a couple of points here. Give me a couple of points. I had six pages and I'm on page one. I'm just going to give you two more. 
I'm going to give you two points and then I'm, I'm done. So that's some things that we can consider from our study. And if you have not ever read um, the book of Acts, I believe we read it during our Daniel fast um, last year. But that's a good, it's a good book to read, the book of Acts. And there's some lessons that are invaluable in the, books of, in the book of Acts. So one thing that I want to share with you on today, one lesson is the lesson of a crippled society. The lesson of a crippled society and what can be done about it. The lesson of a crippled society. And if you look around at our country today, look around at our nation, look at this world. Just look at this world and see how crippled we are. How crippled we are. How, how, how dependent we are on things. You know, people are hooked on drugs and, and, and people are hooked on pornography and people are hooked on a lot of different things. People are hooked on these things, you know. But, you know, righteous leadership does matter. Righteous leadership, it does matter. It's important for us to have a righteous leader in place for the country to be able to go to the level and to go to the place that we need to be in. And that's, that's the same and that's true as it was in the Old Testament when they had kings that were in place. There were many kings that came, many kings that ruled for a lot of years, but they didn't, they didn't recognize God. They didn't reverence God. Now this country, this country that we live in, we said that we are one nation under God, indivisible. That's what we say, that we're one nation, that we're one under God and indivisible. But if you look around at all of the things that are going on in this world today, I'm just going to say that we need to be praying. We need to be praying. We don't need to be talking about things. We need to pray for leadership. We need to pray for our communities, pray for our cities. People in, 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 the, in the church, we're not doing our jobs. We're not doing our part. We need to be praying. We don't need to be around the water cooler talking uh, like the other people on the job. We need to be making a difference. We need to make a difference everywhere we go. The Bible tells us in Romans 12 and 1 that we should not conform to this world. But we should be transformed. We should be transformers. We should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our mind has been changed. Our mind has been regulated for things of God now. So this society is in desperate need. We're in desperate need of the things of God. Paul said in Romans 3 and 23 that all of us have sinned. And we all fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53 and 6 says, We're all like sheep who have gone astray. We have turned everyone to their own way. We're crippled. Luke 13 and 3 says, unless we repent, we will perish. Unless we repent, we're going to perish. So like the lame man at the gate, we are helpless and powerless, spiritually crippled without Christ. And there's a, there's a move afoot to get God out of our government institution, to get, to get God and to, in the name of Jesus specifically, the name of Jesus to be dropped from different prayers that are going on in, in different settings because we have people of different, uh, of different cultures, we have people of different religious beliefs, but this nation was a Christian nation. And how are we going to change and adjust for other people? Yes, we are a melting pot. Yes, we have people from all parts of the world that have come to this country, but, but they're in this country. And I can't see anybody going to Saudi Arabia and, and telling them that we're going to change and we're going to convert them to Christianity. Let's turn these things around. I'm offended by your prayer that you pray. I'm offended by the way that you conduct yourself. No, you're in that country. I believe it says while in Rome, you do as the Romans. Right. We're in this nation. We're in this nation. We're a Christian nation. You know, we have, we have that on our money and everything. In God we trust. In God we trust. But now, are those just words? Are those just words we say we don't really mean it from our heart? The second thing I want to give you, second lesson that we can learn from the book of Acts, is the lesson of divine authority and how to use it. The lesson of divine authority. That's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. That's power in the name of Jesus. I believe that the word tells us that demons tremble in that name. 
But, you know, if, 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 if the government or if, if, if people that we work for want to shun the name of Jesus to keep you from using the name of Jesus and as a minister on my job and when we would have Thanksgiving and Christmas and all those uh, different holidays, you know, they didn't call it Christmas anymore, they call it Happy Holidays. Happy Holidays because Christmas, Christmas offends people, that name offends people. But we've made all these adjustments and people are told People that are in, uh, in, in in position as ministers or, or priests, you know, told not to pray. Don't end your prayer in the name of Jesus because it's offensive to other people. Don't end your prayer in that name. And, you know, I think it's a shame when we take, we take the Lord out of our government. I mean, we've seen the results already when Christ has been taken out of our school system. You know, we've seen the results when, when God was exited out of our schools, then we allowed everything else to come in. Now we have all of the school shootings, we have all of these things, all of the violence that's going on in our schools. But it's praying time, church. It's praying time. It's time for us to pray. It's time for the church to get back to prayer. But we have the authority to use the name of Jesus. And if we use that name of Jesus, I believe that we'll see results. We'll see an impact. So, the answer to a crippling generation is the name of Jesus Christ. We need Jesus, not silver and gold. Now God is going to make sure that we have what we need. He's going to make sure that our needs are met. He's going to make sure that our needs are met. We have to just trust Him that way. God is going to do it. I heard them talking in Sunday school this morning about, uh, about being lazy. And we know what the Bible says about that. A man that does not work, you're not going to eat. You're not going to eat, right? You're not going to, you're not going to work. You're not going to eat. So we have responsibilities. Now all this came in, you know, after after Adam and Eve did what they did in the garden, and then everything changed because there was a life of luxury that was laid up for for, for them and for the rest of us, eternal life, uh, really. But it all changed after sin crept in. So we have to be we have to be wise and we have to be discerning. Be discerning of what the word is. And let me just give you the third point for all of those that are at the TDR Lord School of Ministry. So you have three mm -hmm. three things that I left you. Yeah. Does your preacher, does your pastor give you three points? <laughs> I have more than three points. I'm going to give you this final point here. Uh, the last lesson that we can learn from Acts is the lesson of living, of a living message. The lesson of a living message and its relevance for our time. The lesson of a living message and its relevance for our time. So Lenin was a great man, but he's dead. You know, all these other great leaders that were in our country and other countries, they did great things, but they're dead. But Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, although they crucified him, they buried him, but he was raised up on the third day. He came back. He's the only one. He's the only one that was able to come back. You know, now Jesus called back some people while he was here on earth, but they died again. You know, Lazarus died again. And that, that, that young boy that he laid his hands on that coffin at that funeral procession, that boy died again. He, yeah, you, you came back to life then, but you died again. But Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Three days in the ground, went down into hell and preached the word, and then rose up on the third day and ascended back into heaven to be on the right hand side of his father. And he still lives today. He's a living, he's a living man in heaven. He's living up there. And when, when Stephen was being stoned, Jesus got up off of his seat. Acts 7 and 55. Jesus stood up. He stood up when Stephen was being stoned. Stephen, Stephen looked up to heaven. And he said what Jesus said, forgive them, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus stood up, and I believe Jesus applauded Stephen uh, for, the, for, the, for the way that he conducted himself, even in the midst of all that he was going through. And I believe that God is looking at us today, people of God. What you, what you need, what you need today, God has it. So I don't know what it is that you have that you're desiring from God right now, what you need from God right now. I want you to know that God has it. He has it. So we think the answer is in money. But we see people with a lot of money. 
are very unhappy. People with a lot of money committing suicide. You know, people are doing some things that um, you know you just wouldn't you would you would phantom them. In. You know, you think that they have everything that they want and everything that they need and more, but they're still unhappy. So happiness is not found in the, in the things that that we um, that we that we possess. But I tell you, our true happiness and our true joy is in our relationship.